Hello, this is Music Tech Explained, the visual approach. If you want to learn the new features and changes in Logic Pro 10.7 that nobody explained to you before, especially Dolby Atmos, then keep on watching and I will tell you all about it. Welcome to Music Tech Explained, the visual approach. My name is Edgar Rothermich, author of the best-selling book series Graphically Enhanced Manuals. In this video, I will explain new features and changes in the Logic Pro Update 10.7. There are already quite a few videos available about this update, but most of them just glance over the features or won't provide any details, especially about Dolby Atmos. In addition to some of Logic's new features that didn't get mentioned, I will provide a few of the most important facts of Logic's Dolby Atmos integration. Information you won't find anywhere else. But before we get started, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell button to get notified about exciting new videos in my Music Tech Explained YouTube channel. So let's get started. The video has two chapters. In the first one, I provide some super important information about Logic's Dolby Atmos integration. It is a big topic with lots of new facts and concepts you have to learn and understand. That would be a training series all by itself, which I'm already working on. However, in this chapter, I will already provide six of the most important concepts you have to understand before starting with your Atmos project in Logic Pro. First, a few words about the big confusion about spatial audio, then the very special signal flow in the Logic implementation, the hidden sample rate conversion you definitely should know about, then the big question about beds versus objects, then a journey into the jungle of the Atmos routing, and finally a brief look at binaural render modes. In the second chapter, I will show some of the lesser known new features in this update that might still have a big impact on your logic projects. Some are not even mentioned in the release notes. If you want to find out and learn all about the new features and changes in this logic update, I highly recommend checking out my book Logic Pro – What's New in 10.7. On 106 pages, I explain everything with unique diagrams and graphics that you won't find anywhere else. The confusion about spatial audio. There is a lot of wrong information and misconceptions on the internet about spatial audio. So let me try to shed some light on that. So Logic Pro now has Dolby Atmos integrated and you can mix in Dolby Atmos without any additional cost. The only thing you have to invest is time because Dolby Atmos itself comes with a learning curve, in addition to learn how it is implemented in Logic. Most of you know by now that you turn on Dolby Atmos in your Logic project by opening the pop-up menu of the spatial audio parameter and from there you select Dolby Atmos. You can do that in the project chooser when you start a new project or from the project settings and select the audio tab when you want to switch to Dolby Atmos on an existing project. Or you can go to the Mix menu and choose the new command Dolby Atmos, which directly opens the Audio Project Settings window. That's all very straightforward, but did you even ask yourself what's up with that spatial audio term? Why doesn't Logic just have a parameter called Dolby Atmos with a simple on-off button? Would make sense, right? If you paid attention to the Apple universe lately, then you might have come across the term spatial audio already. That setting appears on your Apple TV and on your iPhone when using your AirPods. Also, when Apple announced Dolby Atmos for the Apple Music streaming service, they introduced spatial audio with support for Dolby Atmos. So now in Logic, you see that same spatial audio term where you select Dolby Atmos. That must be the same spatial audio Apple is talking about. <coughs> Wrong. That spatial audio parameter in Logic where you enable Dolby Atmos has nothing, and I repeat, nothing to do with Apple's spatial audio. Here is the difference. Apple's spatial audio refers to the algorithm that creates a three-dimensional immersive sound using speaker virtualization and headphone virtualization. To create that sound, it can use a Dolby Atmos mix, but also a surround mix and even a good old stereo mix. 
The spatial audio parameter that we have in logic has nothing to do with that algorithm. And logic just uses that generic term, spatial audio, that refers to a three-dimensional sound space like immersive audio or 3D audio. To prove that point, just switch the language for logic to German and you will see that the spatial audio parameter is called 3D audio or to pronounce it properly 3D audio. Keep in mind, Dolby Atmos is just one of many immersive sound formats. There are Sony 360 Reality Audio, Oro 3D and even Ambisonics. So Logic uses the spatial audio parameter to select the actual format that can produce three-dimensional audio. In this case, Dolby Atmos. Maybe a future Logic update could also support other formats like the Sony 360 Reality Audio and then that could appear in the pop-up menu. This could be the same thinking for Apple Music that might support Sony 360 Reality Audio in the future too. So, long story short, the spatial audio parameter in Logic has nothing to do with Apple's spatial audio engine. You just select an immersive sound format, in our case Dolby Atmos. That's it. And while we're at it, there is one little detail I want to point out about this selector. Here I have the project chooser open to configure a new project. Pay attention to the frame rate and the surround format currently set to 25 frames per second and 5.1. When I enable Dolby Atmos, Logic automatically sets those two parameters to a specific value. The frame rate will be 24 frames per second and the surround format is set to 7.1.2. Keep in mind that the same will happen if you switch to Dolby Atmos in the audio project settings. The reason for that are the requirements for a Dolby Atmos master file. It has to be set to 24 frames per second and the bed tracks are at a maximum channel width of 7.1.2. You can set it lower, but that is a different story. Unfortunately, when talking about Dolby Atmos specs, there is something that Logic overlooked and hopefully that will be fixed in a future update. The Dolby Atmos master file that you deliver to your aggregator or record company has to have a sample rate of 48 kHz. So at the moment, when you create a new project, make sure that you definitely set your sample rate to 48K, because by selecting Dolby Atmos from the pop-up menu, it will not be set automatically, as it should. Now I want to discuss the most important aspect when mixing Dolby Atmos in Logic, the signal flow. Yes, there are many videos out there talking about object tracks, bad tracks and the Dolby Atmos plugin. However, you have to understand more about the actual signal flow of those tracks, how they enter the Dolby Atmos plugin and equally important where the signal is going after the Dolby Atmos plugin. Here's a signal flow diagram that I created to demonstrate those mysterious ways. Let me show some important elements to understand the basic concepts. There are additional concepts about panning and routing of pan information that is crucial in understanding the Dolby Atmos workflow, together with the distinction between a channel-based signal and an object-based signal. I explain all that important details in the book. Now what do you see on the diagram? On the right there is the master channel strip with a loaded Dolby Atmos plugin. You can place plugins before and after that plugin but you better follow the signal flow to understand what that means. In the middle, you can see the Dolby Atmos plugin window with the various controls. And on the left, you see five pan controls that represent five tracks in your project. The first three pan controls represent three tracks that are routed to the bed, making them bed tracks. The first one is a mono track, the second one a stereo track, and the third one a multi-channel track. All three are routed to the surround output. In this case, the output of the surround panel is 7.1.2 because the surround format in the project setting is set to 7.1.2. You can see those corresponding speaker channels on the plugin window. Those 10 channels are listed in the Dolby Atmos plugin window under the surround bed section. 
Keep in mind that the channels in the surround bed section correspond to the currently selected surround format that you set in the audio project settings. Let me demonstrate that. I have the audio project settings window open where I choose the surround format. On the left is the surround panel that opens when you double click on a pan control of that track. And on the right is the Dolby Atmos plugin window. If I change the surround format to 5.1, you can see the surround panel changing to display those 5.1 channels, the speaker icons plus the LFE channel. And the plugin now shows only five channels in the surround bed section. If I change to 7.1, the surround panel now shows the 7.1 channels. Keep in mind that you see only the seven channels, the dot one, the surround, is not shown as a speaker and is only shown as an LFE level slider. The Dolby Atmos plugin now shows the 7.1 channels. Now, if I switch back to 7.1.2, the default channel width, you will see two extra speaker icons on the panel, representing the height speakers that you can see on the plugin listed as left top mid and right top mid. So every track that is set to the surround output using the surround panel is routed to those 10 inputs of the Dolby Atmos plugin. But that is not the entire story, because technically those bed tracks are routed to the input of the master channel strip that are indicated with this red arrow on the diagram. That means if you place any effects plugins before the Dolby Atmos plugin, then all the bed tracks are summed and processed before they actually reach the Dolby Atmos plugin. This lets you apply EQ or limiting to the bed tracks. This might be tempting, thinking, great, here's my mix bus to add all my mastering plugins. Absolutely not. Hold that thought before we now discuss the signal flow of the object tracks. First, a definition of an object track in Logic. It requires two conditions. A track has to be routed to the surround output and you have to select the 3D object panel for its pan controller. This only works on a mono track or a stereo track, but not on multi-channel tracks. Here is the main difference of an object track compared to a bed track. The audio signal on an object track is routed directly to the Dolby Atmos plugin listed in the 3D section of the plugin window. But here is the crucial part. If you look at the diagram on the left, I indicated that the audio signal and the pan signal are separate. That means the position that you set in the 3D object panel is routed as a separate data from its corresponding audio signal. So we have the audio data and pan metadata signal. Keep in mind that these two signals are kept separately until the Dolby Atmos renderer creates a channel-based output when playing back your Dolby Atmos mix and that is while listening to your Dolby Atmos mix in Logic. Or later when the Dolby Atmos song that you mix is played back on the device of the end consumer, for example, an iPhone. So fact number one is that all object tracks keep their audio and pan signal separate. And here is fact number two that is specially about the Logic implementation. All the signals from the object tracks are also sent to the Dolby Atmos plugin, but through the side door, if you will. Look at the signal flow diagram and you will realize the major implications. Any process that you place before the Dolby Atmos plugin on the master channel strip has no effect on any object tracks in your project, zero. If you think, no problem, then I put my limiter after the Dolby Atmos plugin. Nice try, but it does not work, as we will see when we now look at the output of the Dolby Atmos plugin. The output is equally complicated and I hope the diagram will help to decipher that. There are two different outputs that I indicate with the orange color and the green color. The orange color represents the Dolby Atmos master file that you create when you export your project to an ADM BWF file. 
That is the new command under the file menu, export submenu, project as ADM BWF file. That is your mix that you upload to your aggregator like DistroKit to get it distributed to the Apple Music streaming service and the other streaming services. As you can see, that file is created directly from the output of the Dolby Atmos plugin, ignoring any plugins that you place after it. Even the volume fader has no effect. That means no volume adjustments or fade outs. Placing meter plugins makes sense and you should do that so you can check the level and the loudness to meet the Dolby Atmos specs of minus 18 LUFS integrated loudness and minus 1 dB true peak. Now let's look at the green signal in the diagram. That signal goes through all plugins after the Dolby Atmos plugin, including the volume fader and reaches the monitoring format selector. This innocent selector is the heart of the Dolby Atmos system. It represents the renderer, the engine that converts the object-based Dolby Atmos signal into a channel-based speaker system so you can listen to it. For example, if you have a 7.1.4 speaker setup in your studio, then you would select 7.1.4 and your mix is translated to that speaker format. If you select binaural, then your three-dimensional Atmos mix is translated into a two-channel binaural audio signal so you can listen to your three-dimensional mix over standard headphones. There is a lot of additional information required that you have to learn and read about to better understand what all that means. I cover that in my book Mixing in Dolby Atmos – How it Works, with lots of additional diagrams to explain those sometimes complicated concepts. But wait, there is one more aspect about the green line in our signal flow diagram. The green signal represents the monitoring signal, how you listen to your Dolby Atmos mix. Now, this is the same signal that gets bounced to a standard audio file, WAV, AFF, MP3, AAC, whatever you select, when you use the regular bounce command and your settings in the bounce window. You can create a full 7.1.4 or just a 5.1 surround file from your Atmos mix. Totally new possibilities for film composers, by the way. Or when you have the monitoring format set to binaural, you can bounce your Dolby Atmos mix to a two-channel binaural audio signal disguised as a standard stereo file that you can listen on any audio player or even upload to YouTube. This is where we get into the practical aspect of Dolby Atmos, and most people are not even aware of the possibilities that you have now in Logic. More on that in future videos. For now, I hope you have a better understanding about the basic signal flow concept when using Dolby Atmos in Logic. This is the foundation of all the other concepts and components in your Dolby Atmos mix. But be aware, we are just scratching the surface here. Here is an important message about the sample rate and your Dolby Atmos project. As I mentioned at the beginning, your Dolby Atmos project has to be set to the sample rate of 48 kHz, because that is the required sample rate for the Dolby Atmos master file, the ADM BWF file that you export. There are two scenarios. One, you start with a new project and that is set to 48K or you use an existing project to create an Atmos mix for it. And luckily it was recorded in 48K. But what happened with scenario two, when you have a project that has a different sample rate other than 48K? Don't worry, the Logic developer covered your back with two important invisible interventions. Two things will happen. Let's say you have a project with a sample rate of 44.1 kHz. When you export that project to an ADM BWF file, Logic will create that file but performs a sample rate conversion to 48K so the file is at the right sample rate. The second thing happens in the background and that is something you should keep an eye on. Let's look at the signal flow diagram and focus on the Dolby Atmos plugin. That plugin is the actual Dolby Atmos renderer component that can only operate in 48K. Here is what Logic is doing if your project is not in 48K. It is taking any audio signal that goes into the 
Dolby Atmos plugin and sample rate converts it to 48 kHz in real time. But that is only half the story. Logic also sample rates the signal coming out of the plugin back from 48K to the sample rate of your project, for example 44.1, to be played back on your audio interface. Your audio interface doesn't even notice any of that back and forth activity that goes on under the hood. However, someone has to do the heavy lifting and that is your CPU. If you use all the 128 input signals of the Atmos plugin, then you better check the CPU meter in Logic to see if you're running into a bottleneck. So the moral of the story, try to run your project in the native 48K to save those precious CPU cycles for your mix. Now let's talk about the decision bad tracks versus object tracks. There are a lot of consideration to determine which track should be set to which one. Here are just a few important ones. I started with a new project set to Dolby Atmos with a single audio track and these are the important configurations that happened behind the scene. The audio track is automatically routed to the surround output, which represents the 7.1.2 channels that are sent to the 10 input channels of the Dolby Atmos plugin. The other automatic configuration that happens is that the output channel strip is not visible anymore. It is still there when you click on the All button of the mixer, but I don't want to go into that in this video because it is getting complicated there. Now you can see only the master channel strip that has been promoted. The tiny level meters on the channel strip are now split into two with the bottom section showing the ear level and LFE channels and the section on top showing the level of the 204 height channels. It now has the effect slots and the Dolby Atmos plugin is already loaded by default. Click on it to toggle show height the Dolby Atmos plugin window with all the related controls. Little advice, don't export your Atmos mix until you fully understand every control on this window. Now let's create a couple of more audio channel strips. They are all routed to surround, which means they are routed to the surround bed of the Dolby Atmos plugin. The pan control on all those channel strips is a surround panel and you can actually track that little tiny puck to position that signal in space. However, it is better to double click on the pan control to open the big surround panel window. On the surround panel window, you see the seven ear level speakers in blue and the two height speakers, the dot two, as the greenish speaker icons. You can mute a specific channel by clicking on its speaker icon. Be aware that you have a separate slider for the center channel and the LFE channel, the subwoofer. The LFE channel doesn't have its own speaker icon. You have a planar view and a spherical view. In planar view, the puck moves the signal only on ear level. The spherical view acts like a dome shape looking from above. So when you drag the puck to the center, you increase the elevation of your signal that you can see on the elevation parameter. Here's an important note. The surround format that you see on the surround panel is determined by the surround format that you selected in the audio project setting. When you change the format, you will see the change in the surround panel and in the Dolby Atmos plugin under the surround bed section as I demonstrated before. So now the question is, how do I change a bed track to an object track? When you create a new track, you don't have the option to choose an object track, unless you copy an object track. By default, it is always a bed track and you have to change it to an object track. You make the switch by changing the pan control. Click on the output slot or right click on the pan control and you will see the menu item 3D object panel. That's the one. Select it and voila, that track is now an object track. This is what happens to the track. The pan control is now a square control where you can still move the puck around. If you double click on the pan control, it opens the 3D panel window. That is technically also a surround panel with a slightly different user interface. You just pan in space without a specific speaker destination. 
And very important, you can't route the signal to the LFE, the subwoofer. One big restriction of an object track to keep in mind. One more change happens in the Dolby Atmos plugin. Any object track in your project will be listed in the 3D object section with a single ring for a mono track or a double ring icon for a stereo track. You have a total of 118 available objects and a stereo track counts as two objects. At the bottom you can see the number counts. Here's a trick. The 3D viewer shows the position in 3D space that you determined with the 3D object panel as individual dots. Keep in mind that you won't see any bad signals here. However, the signals are only displayed as blue dots if there is a signal playing. However, any object track that you select under the 3D object section will display its position as a white dot. There are a lot of strange user interface decisions regarding the routing and panning that you will encounter once you play around with. Let me point out just a few. There is no easy switch to change the functionality of a track from an object back to a bed. Let's see if you can follow the logic. If you open the pan control menu, there is no option to switch to the surround panel. Even worse, the options that you see here are kind of dangerous because when you select pan, for example, it will change the track to a stereo track and the stereo output channel strip appears that should always be hidden in an Atmos mix without going down that rabbit hole for the moment. The output slot on the object track only shows surround, even though an object track is not routed to the surround bed. Also, on top of that output menu, it says no output, even though the output slot says surround. If you go to the output menu, it only shows the option surround, and that is what you have to click on. If you do that, the pan control changes to the surround panel, voila, and the track again functions as a bed track. So that is the only way to change an object track back to a bed track. Select surround from the output slot menu. In the following demonstration, I want to show how important it is to understand the signal that goes into the Dolby Atmos plugin and the signal that comes out of it. Here is the setup. In this project, I have only one bed track and one object track. Both have a signal generator that I use to better show how that signal is routed. On the master track, I have a level meter before the Dolby Atmos plugin. First, let's recap the role of the surround format that you set in the audio project settings. It determines the channel width of the surround bed. Let me demonstrate what that means. I show the surround panel of the bed track the level meter before the Atmos plugin and the Dolby Atmos plugin window. And I turn on the tone generator of the bed track. When I move the puck around, you see how that mono signal gets panned around in the 7.1.2 3D space. Now if I open the project settings and set the surround format to 5.1, then the surround panel on the track becomes 5.1. The signal going into the Dolby Atmos renderer is 5.1 and you see on the Dolby Atmos plugin that the surround bed shows only the 5.1 channels. If I set the surround format to 7.1, then the surround panel on the track now is 7.1, the signal going into the Dolby Atmos renderer is 7.1, and you see on the Dolby Atmos plugin that the surround bed shows only the 7.1 channels. If I set the surround format to 7.1.2, then the surround panel on the track now is 7.1.2, you see the additional height speakers, the signal going into the Dolby Atmos renderer is also 7.2. There are the two height channels, left top mid and right top mid. And you see on the Dolby Atmos plugin that the surround bed shows only the 10 channels of the 7.1.2 format. Now I add another level meter right after the Dolby Atmos plugin and it gets interesting. 
First important observation. The output of the Dolby Atmos plugin has a 7.1.4 format, as we can see on the meters. Second observation. The four height speakers of the 7.1.4 output are different from the two height speakers of the 7.1.2 input. 7.1.2 has a pair of height speakers in the middle and the 7.1.4 has a pair on the front ceiling and the back of the ceiling. This little detail has major implication on the decision what tracks to be used as bed tracks and which one to use as object tracks. There lies the reason for your decision. Don't just follow recommendations on the internet saying drums should be on the bed track, guitar should be on object tracks and so on. Try to understand what is happening here and then you can make the right decision that is right for your song and not just a random cookie cutter tip on what you should do. Here is a fundamental difference between a bed track and an object track. A bed track has only one pair of height speakers located in the center of the ceiling. You can see on the meter before the Atmos plugin that this is just one channel. However, if you look at the 7.1.4 output, that signal is played back on both the front and back ceiling speakers. You cannot position a bed track to the front or back of the ceiling or anywhere in between with a bed track. Now I open the 3D object panel of an object track and enable the tone generator. I pan the signal to the ceiling and now move between front and back. That means the signal is moving along the ceiling as you can see on the virtual room display and the 7.1.4 meters that is placed after the Atmos plugin. From the previous signal flow diagram, now you understand why the meters before the Atmos plugin doesn't show any signal. So think about it. If you have any track with an instrument that you want to position precisely in space, especially along the ceiling, then here is your answer whether to use a bed track or object track. To take it up a notch, let's look at the monitoring format setting in the Dolby Atmos renderer. This is the actual Dolby Atmos renderer that converts the object-based signal to a channel-based signal. Remember what I showed in the signal flow diagram earlier. All the object tracks send their audio signal and pan information separate to the Dolby Atmos renderer. And that data is kept separate when exporting to the Dolby Atmos master file. When it enters the renderer, all that information is processed to create a multi-channel output signal, similar when you downmix a 5.1 mix to a stereo. Choosing a setting in the monitoring format tells the renderer to what channel-based format it should render the Dolby Atmos mix. Here is something that might look confusing. Right now the monitoring format is set to 7.1.4. That means the Dolby Atmos mix is rendered to a 7.1.4 channel format. This would only make sense if you actually have a 7.1.4 speaker setup in your studio and who hasn't? Many film composers have at least a 5.1 setup in their studio. So if I change the monitoring format to 5.1, I tell the renderer to process the Dolby Atmos mix as a 5.1 surround mix playing back over six speakers. That means that all the height speaker signals are folded down into the available surround speakers. But the important thing to pay attention to is the meter after the Atmos plugin. It still shows all the 7.1.4 channels, but the 5.1 output signal only uses the six of them according to the channel indicators. So keep in mind, the monitoring format selection doesn't change the number of level meters. If you select binaural from the monitoring format, then the renderer creates a binaural audio signal that is sent out through the left and right channel. And that is what you see on the level meters. As I mentioned earlier, whatever you select in the monitoring format, that is the rendered signal that is also bounced to disk as a channel-based audio file. 
As you can see, that is all very powerful, but also somehow complex when you dive into it to control all those elements and all those signals floating around. Again, we are only scratching the surface here with the technical concepts. You have to wrap your head around all that before you translate all that power and possibilities into creative decisions to make a stunning Dolby Atmos mix. There are a lot of little details about Dolby Atmos itself in addition to how it is implemented in Logic. I only want to point out one final parameter in this video, the binaural render modes. If you open the Dolby Atmos plugin window, you will see next to the surround bed channels and all the objects an additional column named binaural render. Here's a quick rundown what that is all about. The values are grayed out and can't be changed when you have any monitoring format selected other than binaural. Selecting binaural makes them active. Each individual channel of a bed and every object can be set to one of the four values – far, mid, near and off. The LFE channel is always set to off. These are the so-called binaural render modes. Three different HRTF models, the head related transfer function, that creates the impression to have a signal closer or further away when listening over headphones in binaural mode. This is the point where you have to learn more about the topic of binaural audio. Most Logic users won't have dedicated surround speakers and rely on binaural mode to mix their song in Dolby Atmos over headphones. So, there is no way around to educate yourself about the technology of binaural audio. Otherwise, it will be a guessing game on how your Dolby Atmos mix sounds when people listen to it on Apple Music or Tidal. In case you have the luxury and can mix on discrete speakers of a 7.1.4 or higher speaker layout, then you should keep an eye on the I.O. assignment page of the Audio Preferences window. It has changed in 10.7 with the addition of the six height speakers to route them to your audio interface. This is also where you can see that the four height speakers of a 7.1.4 system are not just two additional height speakers compared to the 7.1.2 layout. These are four differently positioned height speakers. Again, just to point you in the right direction, you can see that Dolby Atmos requires much more in-depth discussion that I will address in upcoming videos. So don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Besides the big Dolby Atmos integration, there were a few other additions and changes that I cover all in my book. Let me just discuss a few that didn't get much press so far. Of course, now we have dark mode in Logic and a lot of graphical changes to buttons, shades of grey and little nip and tucks throughout the Logic interface. Were they necessary? As long as they improve the workflow of Logic, I'm all for it. But in this update, a lot of changes are kind of counterproductive. So overall, I'm not a big fan of that facelift and rather would have seen the energy spent on other long overdue improvements in Logic. The step sequencer has the most changes and improvements in the 10.7 update. No need to cover that because Eli Kranzberg did a great job in his videos on YouTube and his excellent Groove 3 video series. Please check them out. The Pedalboard plugin has a small but very much welcome addition. If the Pedalboard plugin is inserted on a mono track, then you will see an additional channel format option Mono to Stereo. When you load the plugin with that Mono to Stereo mode option and have a mixer pedal added, you will see a new button on the mixer pedal in the signal routing area. It shows a single ring for Mono and a double ring for Stereo. Just click on the button to switch the output of the mixer pedal between Mono and Stereo. In Stereo mode, the mixer pedal has two additional pan knobs that let you pan the A and B input independently between the left and right output. Next, the loop browser. It has a small addition that can be easily overlooked. Open the browser with the key command O and look at the key signature column that shows the key signature of the corresponding loops. Now it finally indicates if a loop is in a minor scale. 
you can see the additional M to indicate that. If I filter out only the minor loops with a scale parameter in the upper left corner, then you will see all the M's in all those loops in the minor key. And don't forget that you can rearrange the columns and sort by that column, for example, sort by key signature. The next feature, Record Automation with Audio Regions, is technically an addition to an existing feature that were already there in 10.6. To better understand their functionality, let's recap a few important things about automation to understand the functionality and advantage of it. Track automation is automation data that is stored along the track. Its automation curve is visible on the automation lane, functioning as a parallel track alongside the track lane that contains the regions on that track. Region automation is automation data that is stored inside a region. This can be a media region, drama region, and even an audio region that you can see in this case. Automation data represented in logic as fader events that are proprietary logic events similar to MIDI events that can also be displayed in the event list editor. Continuous controllers are MIDI events that can function as automation data for MIDI instruments, for example, CC7 for volume or CC10 for pan. In logic, there is a difference between track automation and region automation. Automation data, the fader events, can be stored as track automation on the automation lane or as region automation inside a region. You can view these two types of automation by toggling the automation button on the track lane between track and region. Here, the volume automation, the yellow line, is stored as track automation, indicated by the automation curve spanning from the beginning to the end of the project. The pan automation, the green line, is stored as region automation, inside the region. There are no automation points outside the region. If you open the event list editor, you can see the individual automation points as fader events. There are many pros and cons for when to use track automation or region automation. A discussion for another time. The only thing I want to point out is that an audio region usually contains only the audio data. But in logic, you can actually store these fader events inside an audio region. Two other terms require some attention, or let's say awareness, to better understand this new feature. Recording and writing. When you record audio regions or media regions, you usually use the standard recording process. The project is playing and you are in record mode and you are recording a track, MIDI or audio. For automation, you would use the term writing instead of recording. You are writing automation data while the song is played and you don't have to be in record mode for that. Automation has its own record modes. These are the read, latch, touch and write modes. That process is referred to as writing automation online. Offline would be the process of just drawing automation curves with the mouse. Keep in mind that writing automation applies to track automation and region automation. Quick demonstration. I can select track automation and now write automation on the automation lane. Or I can select region automation and now the automation is written directly into the region. But of course, only if there is already an existing region. Now let's look at that new feature. In 10.6, when you click the automation mode button on the track header of a software instrument track, you would see a menu item record automation with MIDI region. Now in 10.7, when you click the automation mode button on an audio track, you will see a new menu item that looks similar, record automation with audio region. Here is what that means. The important part is the word record. 
That means with this functionality, you can create automation data, those fader events, at the same time when you record media regions or audio regions. I select Region Automation on the track header and start recording an audio region. When I move any controller, for example the volume, then those volume changes will be written into the audio region that is just being recorded. When I open the event list editor for that audio region, I can see the fader events inside the audio region representing the automation control points. You can click on the menu item to enable or disable that feature indicated by the check mark. However, the function only works when the automation mode is set to read and you can only toggle the command when read mode is enabled. If you have any of the other automation modes enabled, then the option is grayed out and not functional. You can also option click the automation mode button and toggle that mode on and off for all tracks. So remember, instead of writing automation, you are recording automation at the same time together with your audio region or MIDI region. And that recorded automation data will be stored inside that newly created region. Okay, that sums it up about the Logic Pro Update version 10.7. For more in-depth explanations of all the new features and changes, please check out my book Logic Pro – What's New in 10.7 with information and details you won't find anywhere else. All the links are on my website dingdingmusic.com. Don't forget to subscribe and check the bell for notifications about exciting new videos in this Music Tech Explained YouTube channel. In addition, you can read my free Logic and Pro Tools tutorials on my website. And please explore the books in my graphically enhanced manual series. They are available in different formats as PDFs from my website, as iBooks on the Apple Bookstore and Kindle and printed books on Amazon. All the links are available on my website dingdingmusic.com.